Welcome to Rad Quarters. Today we'll be talking about ultrasound of hydrosalpinx, pyosalpinx, and tubovarian abscess. So it's all about the tubes. I'm Dr. Dan Koval, and this episode is sponsored by Samsung Ultrasound. The fabulous images that you're about to see were obtained on a Samsung RS85 Prestige ultrasound unit. I'm going to show you a few cases of tubal abnormality, and I'll highlight key teaching points throughout. Let's start with this first case. This was a female patient in her 30s presenting with chronic pelvic pain. Here we're looking at a transvaginal ultrasound of the pelvis. There's the transducer. Here's the uterus on transverse. And notice that in the left adnexa, we have this dilated fluid-filled tubular structure filled with anechoic or completely black simple fluid. And there's associated posterior acoustic enhancement, meaning there's brightening of the tissues posterior to the area of fluid. When we look at the tubular structure on short axis, you can see that there are these tiny little peripheral nodular densities along the inner lumen of the tube. And when we turn sagittal on that, we can see that there is a folded appearance to this tubular structure and it has a C shape. There are also some incomplete septations, meaning they do not completely cut across the lumen. Let's look at this on real time imaging. There's that fluid filled tubular structure in the left adnexa. And then when we stop it here, you can see that there's a C shape configuration to the structure with an incomplete septation. And then here you can see we're looking at the lumen of the dilated tube on short axis. We can see this beads on a string configuration, these tiny little soft tissue nodules on the inner lumen right there as well, uniformly spaced. And there's the uterus here. And notice that the internal contents are anechoic and completely simple. So this is typical for a simple hydrosalpinx. So hydrosalpinx is a fluid-filled blocked fallopian tube. And we see this most commonly after pelvic inflammatory disease because that process can cause inflammation and adhesion that can lead to obstructed fallopian tubes. But it can also be seen in the setting of endometriosis when that involves the tube, patients who've had prior surgery, or really anything that can cause pelvic adhesions, such as Crohn's disease, where there can be recurrent episodes of bowel inflammation and that can lead to pelvic adhesions. In an ultrasound, hydrocelpex will appear as a thin-walled tubular structure filled with this anechoic or simple fluid. And the dilated tube often will fold upon itself, giving this C or S-shaped configuration. And that can help differentiate from a cystic ovarian neoplasm, which will usually be more of a ball shape. Also, if there are septations, they'll be incomplete, as opposed to complete septations we typically see in an ovarian neoplasm or other multilocular collection. And when chronic, we may see the beads on a string sign that I pointed out earlier. So you'll see these short, round, 2 to 3 millimeter projections along the inner tubal wall seen in cross section. And that corresponds to these flattened fibrotic remnants of the normal endosalpingeal folds that occur in the fallopian tubes. You don't want to confuse these with solid mural nodules that you may see in an ovarian neoplasm. But you can differentiate because these are usually much smaller, only 2 to 3 millimeters, and they're often uniformly spaced. Per the ORADS ultrasound risk stratification system, for a simple hydrosalpinx, no additional imaging follow-up is specifically recommended. And these are typically managed uh, per the gynecologist's recommendations based on the patient symptoms and clinical history. All right, let's look at another similar case. So this was a patient in her 60s presenting with chronic right lower pelvic pain. So on this initial image, we're looking at a transverse view of the right adnexa. You may think, is this a large cystic mass? It has some mild low-level debris, but it's primarily anechoic and simple. But we do see, is this a potential mural nodule? So on ultrasound, we always will image in more than one plane. So this is transverse. If we turn sagittal, it becomes much more obvious. So this was that dilated fluid-filled area. But notice how we have a C shape here with an incomplete septation, another incomplete septation here. So just a reminder, always evaluate in both planes. That's also helpful on CT and MRI when evaluating a dilated fallopian tube. That can really help you see that C or S shape. And there's no substitute for real-time scanning, so when we return back to that transverse view, we can actually see there is a C shape here with an incomplete septation. As we continue to follow the tube, you can see that there is a beads on a string configuration. Those are those endosalpingeal folds, those small little 2 to 3 millimeter nodules. And then that portion we were viewing initially was this dilated segment of tube with an obliquely visualized endosalpingeal fold, so not a nodule. All right, so that's hydrosalpinx. Let's look at another case. This was a patient in her late 20s presenting to the emergency department with fever, elevated white blood cell count, and pelvic pain with a suspected clinical diagnosis of pelvic inflammatory disease. So here we're looking at another transvaginal ultrasound. This is a sagittal view through the right adnexal region. And notice that we have a dilated fluid-filled fallopian tube. But what's different about this tube? Well, it's thick-walled, 
And instead of simple anechoic fluid, it contains this heterogeneously echogenic complex fluid. Here's the ovary adjacent to the tube. And then also notice that we have some fluid next to the tube, but it looks a bit complex. We have some septations in that fluid. So more of a complex inflammatory process going on here. Here are the static images, again showing that thick-walled tube, complex fluid within the tube, thick wall, the ovary here adjacent to the tube, and also some fluid adjacent to it that looks a bit complex. So this is typical for a pyosalpinx. In the appropriate clinical setting, this is an indication of pelvic inflammatory disease. And on ultrasound, these will appear as thick-walled tubal structures filled with complex fluid. But similar to hydrosalpinx, they will still have that typical C or S shape of a dilated tubal structure. Instead of the beads on the string sign, it's more common to see the cogwheel sign, which involves thickening of those endosalpingeal folds combined with a thick tubal wall. And unlike the chronic indication for a beads on a string appearance, this is typical for acute tubal inflammation. And this can help you differentiate the tube from bowel or an ovarian neoplasm. And if we also compare back to that second hydrosalpinx I showed you, this is adding color Doppler, we can see that there's not really much flow. But what do you see with the pyosalpinx? We do see some increased flow about the thickened wall because this is an active inflammatory process. So more typical to see tubal wall hyperemia with pyosalpinx. Also, it's common to see associated oophoritis, which is inflammation of the ovary. And when the tube is adherent to that ovary, we describe that as a tubo ovarian complex. And let me show you that on the cine. This is a transverse view of the adnexa. There's that thick walled tube we were looking at earlier with the complex fluid. And then notice this is the ovary adjacent to it. So it's enlarged, and the cysts of the ovary are kind of peripherally displaced, these little follicles. And we can't really separate it from the inflamed tube, but you can still distinctly identify it as the ovary. We just can't separate it out with transducer pressure. So just to compare a tubovarian complex versus the more commonly described tubovarian abscess, both occur in pelvic inflammatory disease, with a complex, as the salpingo oophoritis progresses, which is salpingo is tubal inflammation, oophoritis is ovarian inflammation, those ovary and tube will adhere to each other, but you can still distinctly identify the ovary from the tube. You just can't really separate them with transducer pressure. If the infection continues without treatment, that can then evolve into a tube ovarian abscess. And with that, you'll start to lose the ovarian architecture. You can't really describe where the ovary is compared to the tube. And you'll start to see these pockets of purulent fluid developing in the inflammatory mass. That will appear multilocular. There may be septations and irregular margins. So speaking of tube ovarian abscess, let's look at this final case. So this is a patient in her 20s presenting to the emergency department with pelvic pain, nausea and vomiting, and elevated white count. Here we're looking at a transvaginal image of the cul-de-sac region. So this is the cervix here. There's the external os and the endocervical canal. And posterior to that, we see this dilated fluid-filled tubular structure with some wall thickening and some debris within it. And when we stay sagittal and move into the left adnexa, we can see this inflammatory mass here. It becomes difficult to separate the tube from the mass. There are these pockets of heterogeneously echogenic debris. There's a bit of the tube there, but then we don't really see normal ovarian architecture, do we? We just see these pockets of fluid and this ill-defined inflammatory process. Evaluating this on real-time imaging, there's the sagittal view of the uterus. Posterior to the uterus, we see the dilated fallopian tube leading into this complex adnexal mass-like structure with multilocularity, some complex fluid, and we don't see normal ovarian architecture. We do see some complex fluid there adjacent to the uterus within the pelvis. And when we add color Doppler imaging, what would you expect that we'll find? Well, we see very robust color Doppler flow throughout the tubovarian abscess, indicating hyperemia. You can see that there's some rim hyperemia around this abscess pocket, also around that inflamed dilated tube, much more than we would expect for a hydrosalpinx or even a pyosalpinx in isolation. And this is typical for a tubovarian abscess. So this is a later complication of pelvic inflammatory disease appearing as a complex infectious adnexal mass, usually multilocular with irregular thick walls and septations. They may contain gas, which would appear as areas of echogenicity, bright areas in the mass, with some dirty shadowing or ring down artifact, but often that's better seen on CT. And if this is untreated and progresses, it can evolve to bilateral tubovarian abscesses, and complex fluid in the pelvis is often also present. This patient also had a CT scan showing the inflammatory mass there in the left adnexa with multilocularity rim enhancement adjacent to the uterus here. And then notice all that complex inflammatory fluid, complex fluid surrounding the tubovarian abscess. We also have some fat stranding in the rectouterine space, 
with some reactive rectal wall thickening. So typical for a TOA. So if you recall the tube ovarian complex that I mentioned earlier, again, that's when you have a pilosalpix adhered to the ovary, but you can still make out ovarian architecture. That level of pelvic inflammatory disease often responds well to just antibiotics alone. But a tube ovarian abscess is often still treated initially with antibiotics, but more likely to need percutaneous drainage or surgery. And this patient was initially treated with antibiotics, but then did require laparoscopy and pelvic washout to treat the tube ovarian abscess and then did well afterwards. All right, thank you so much for joining me on that journey through the tubes, and I hope you found that educational. Thank you again to our sponsor, Samsung Ultrasound. If you like this lecture, a great way to support us is to subscribe to the video podcast on Apple or Spotify or by clicking the YouTube subscribe button. Reviews are always greatly appreciated. To see bonus teaching material posted throughout the week, you can follow us on social media. Links are in the show notes or click the YouTube community tab. Until next time, radiology is life.